when night falls. They come into their own. Astrophotographers portray the night sky in spectacular images. With their cameras, they show celestial phenomena in a way never seen before. On voyages of adventure over five continents. Today, Australia. With photographers John Goldsmith and Scott Murray, we head deep into the Western Australian outback with starlit nights and epic landscapes. Sunset at the Pinnacles in Western Australia. At the Nambung National Park, hundreds of limestone pillars stand tall. The remnants of a huge, shifting dune made of quartz sand that rose up from the landscape tens of thousands of years ago. When other visitors head for home, Dr. John Goldsmith sets off on a nocturnal adventure. This time of day at the Pinnacles is absolutely gorgeous. This is the time when the shadows just lengthen out and it's, it's just magnificent, uh, huge shadows that just stretch off to the horizon. So this is the time of the day that we uh, really get underway uh, with the camera gear. So I've got to head off. As an astrophotographer, John Goldsmith's passion is the night sky. Using specialist camera equipment and long exposure times, he captures the movement of the stars across the night sky. What I'm aiming to achieve through astrophotography is to bring the wonders of the universe to people, to bring experiences that so many people do not get to experience themselves, and to share that with people around the world. Because one thing that I've learnt is that our planet really is a small place, and that's what astrophotography reveals to us. The time-lapse shots reveal the night sky in spectacular fashion. The hours fly by and the rising moon shines as bright as the sun. Since most of us can't see the night sky as clearly as our forefathers could, the animated photos serve to remind us that we are part of a greater universe. With John Goldsmith, we embark on a voyage of discovery to Australia's most star-struck locations. Perth the westernmost city in Australia. Its prosperity was founded on the mining of valuable natural resources, such as gold and iron ore. The office blocks on the banks of the Swan River are testimony to the boom. Every two years, thousands of stargazers make a pilgrimage to Perth for Astrofest. This year, a photographic exhibition will display John's best pictures, 
the result of his numerous expeditions. It was in Egypt, on the trail of the comet Hale-Bopp, that John's passion for astrophotography began. But it was his picture of a comet over Stonehenge that made him famous. John is part of a community of astrophotographers called The World at Night, photographers who wish to enchant people with their pictures and encourage them to look up at the night sky. John lives in a leafy suburb of Perth. A kookaburra, Australia's famous kingfisher, watches him with interest as he packs up his gear. Today, he's off once more to Australia's darkest places, fascinated by the myths of the Australian Aborigines and their view of the night sky. On this trip, he wants to find out more about their ancient and fascinating stories. The trip through the Western Australian outback will last just under three weeks and take him through regions devoid of people and with no mobile phone reception. We use a range of different devices for safety and one of the really important ones is an EPIRB device. Uh, this is a, an emergency beacon. It's pretty important. It says use only during situations of grave and imminent danger. Um, I hope we're not going to need to use something like this uh, on our journey, but, um, but it's important to have this type of gear uh, during our travels. As we cross the Swan River to head into the wilderness, a distance of 2,600 kilometres lies ahead of us. The destination on this first leg is Lake Ballard, a huge salt lake two days' drive away. The Great Eastern Highway leads straight across the continent, all the way to Sydney. We have to move out of the cities to go into remote areas. We begin to encounter the outback of Western Australia. Vast landscapes, very arid, very dry, and almost no people. Before night falls, we find a place to stay. A motel in Kalgoorlie, an old mining town 600 kilometers from our starting point. For astrophotographers, the night sky is an infinite playground that changes from night to night. Sometimes the moon is an enormous ball of stone other times, it's a mere dot peeking out from behind the clouds, yet bright as the sun. The photographers use their camera's focal length and exposure times like a brush to paint their extraterrestrial worlds. Kalgoorlie is located on the Golden Mile, one of the largest veins of gold in the world. More than a hundred years ago, an Irish immigrant discovered the precious metal and a gold rush was born. On the edge of town is the Super Pit, Australia's largest gold mine. 
From the kilometre-long pit, dump trucks carry 28 tonnes of gold a year. On the Goldfield Highway, the journey now heads north. Tiny, almost abandoned towns drift by. During the gold rush, Menzies was bustling with life. But once the gold was gone, most of the people went too. Travelling on the roads out here, roads that just stretch all the way to the horizon. And the weather can change so quickly. Storms that roll in, droughts and even floods. So although the landscape looks very dry, the circumstance can change so quickly. From Menzies, it's now just 50 kilometers to the Salt Lake, Lake Ballard. From here, there is only a dirt track. A smattering of rain soon passes, but the road leads straight into the setting sun. The problem is the water on the windscreen. Here I've got a clear view, but through the windscreen, it's no good. Lake Ballard, its dry, glistening salt crust extends for miles. At the edge of this expanse, a small hill rises out of the ground, the subject of many an Aboriginal myth. From this bird's eye view, the trails made by visitors look almost like brush strokes in an abstract painting. Dotted over an area of 10 square kilometers are 51 steel sculptures by the artist Anthony Gormley, each one an abstract representation of a real person from the town of Menzies. Lake Ballard is just such a remarkable landscape a flat, vast, dry salt lake. And the salt comes to the surface as you're walking across, and it forms an incredible crystalline salt surface, pure white, a magical place. For his project, the artist, Anthony Gormley, scanned people with a laser, then altered their shape. As a result, the skinny figures in the salt landscape have a peculiar, almost extraterrestrial quality. John is fascinated by the inhabitants of the region and their stories, especially those concerned with the night sky. Hi, how are Hi. you? Good. Yeah, my name's John. Ah, I'm Laurel. Laurel, good to see you. Sue. Good to see you, Sue, John. Hi. Yeah, how are you? Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. 
Lake Ballard. Fantastic spot. Yes, yeah. it is. Spectacular. Yeah. Yes. I find Australia's cultural history to be really special. 60,000 years of continuous human occupation. So, so this is your country, yes. part of your country? Or, yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. And it's Aboriginal culture and many cultures. And all of those cultures have been based on a very detailed, special knowledge of the environment in which Aboriginal people have lived for many thousands of years. And so to be able to hear stories from elders and people who have wonderful experience of the natural bushland and the cosmos is just such a special opportunity, a special experience. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Yes, the Seven Sisters, they used to come down here on Earth and they did a lot of hunting. One day they were there and uh, long came a visitor looking for a wife. One girl spotted him and she fell in love with him. <laughs> And next thing she was trying to hang back and stay with him. Yeah. And the other sister said, oh, we're all ready to go. And away they went. And next thing she was left behind. So you can see six sisters up there and the seventh one is trailing behind. Mm, mm, That's mm. the seventh sister. Yeah. Mm. So the seven sisters story really is a, a love story. Yes, yes, it is a love story. Yes, yes. And it's right through Australia. Mm, mm. The seven sisters, or Pleiades, appear in the night sky as small clusters of stars. In many cultures, they have a special, mythical meaning. In Australia, their ancient story has numerous variations. John has been collecting these stories for many years. He has written his PhD about the Aborigines and their relation to the night sky. The campfire has gone out and John prepares his nightly photo session. I love the peacefulness of astrophotography. The focus and the attention on the tasks at hand and the quietness of the landscape. In many cases, you are the one person witnessing this astronomical event in these incredible landscapes. With time-lapse photography, the film is shot at 25 photos per second, but each picture is exposed for a whopping 30 seconds. Despite a night of continual shooting, the result is only a few seconds of film. His nights are long and often only end at dawn.
The next day sees us fly around 1,400 kilometers to Broome in northwestern Australia, where John hopes to meet up with a young colleague. Scott Murray, a security guard at a uranium mine, has taken time off work for this adventure holiday. I've been photographing for quite a while. Um, over recent times, I've been getting more into astrophotography. And living in the Northern Territory, I've got clear black skies, like half time of the year. An ambitious amateur photographer, he wants to learn all he can about time-lapse photography and has offered John his help. I've spoke to him on the phone. He sounds very knowledgeable. He knows what he's talking about. I've seen his photos, they're amazing, and his night time lapses are awesome. The photographic excursion will take the two of them to one of the most remotest regions in Australia, the Kimberley. They have chosen to meet at the coastal town of Broome, from where they will travel in Scott's 4x4. Arrived in Broome. Arrived in it's Broome. really good to be here. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is trip number seven for me, actually. So it's uh, yeah, it's enjoy. really good the to be here. Been great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now they have to fit two sets of photographic gear into one vehicle, as well as enough drinking water, diesel, and camping equipment. But before they head into the wilderness, they must stay one more night in Broome. The coastal town is known for its endless empty Indian Ocean beaches. Less than 15,000 people now live in the capital of the Kimberley region. But more than a hundred years ago, Broome was the centre of the Australian pearl industry, a boom immortalised by the town's bronze statues. Close to the town, Cable Beach is a prime location to watch the sunset or take a ride on a camel. John explains to Scott his plans for the trip, how he wants to capture a meteor shower using time-lapse photography. This is no mean feat and something he has never managed before. But things are looking up. A meteor shower is expected in a few days, triggered by the tail of a comet. What happens is that if you imagine the sun yes. in this position here, and around the sun is the Earth. Right, the yes. orbit of the Earth. Yes. And the comet orbit is this really elongated orbit, very roughly like that. Yeah. So 76 years it takes to go all the way around. And it's when the our planet goes through that a stream of particles, that's when the meteor shower happens in May and then later in October. You know, and to see to see a good meteor shower, a strong display, can be quite spectacular. Yeah. Tomorrow morning, they will head into the heart of the Kimberley region in search of the best conditions for astrophotography. But they are not going to let this night in Broome go to waste. At the beach, they set up their time-lapse equipment a slider that uses servo motors to move the camera forward millimetre by millimetre and a computer that calculates the speed, travel distance and exposure time. 
Just setting up takes hours. At dawn and dusk, kangaroos venture out from the high grasses. In all, there are 65 species of kangaroo across the Australian continent. Our journey takes us along the Great Northern Highway towards the east. The destination, Wolf Creek Crater, a huge meteorite crater in the heart of the wilderness. The Kimberley is the northernmost part of Western Australia and it's a vast landscape, lots of remote area, very few people, a very sparsely populated region. And it contains wonderful wilderness areas. Travelling along these seemingly never-ending roads takes us past gnarled boab trees that survive long dry seasons by storing water in their thick trunks. Some Aborigines still know how to extract the water and which parts of the plant are edible. we rarely come across other vehicles. Wolf Creek Crater is just under 800 kilometers away, so they plan to break halfway at Windjana Gorge, a paradise for nature photographers. As this is where the tarmac road ends, Scott and John now need to let some air out of their tires. This increases the area of tire on the ground, making it better for driving off-road. The Gibb River Road was laid in 1960 and nicknamed the Beef Road, as the Kimberley farmers used to take their cattle to the abattoirs on the coast. Let's have a look. Right, good. That is a great campsite. Yeah. Wow. Look at the colours. That is excellent. Awesome sunset. The colours, yeah. Nice spot, yeah. Very nice. What a location. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've made it. We have, we've arrived. Yeah. John and Scott pitch up at the campsite at Windjana Gorge. They soon have company. But the weather isn't perfect, with more clouds than usual for this time of year.
Early morning at Winjana Gorge. Hundred meter high rock faces line the Leonard River. As it is currently the dry season, very little water now flows here. But after heavy rainfall, the river can turn into a torrent, racing through a landscape that was formed by a rising sea floor 250 million years ago. Winjana Gorge is a stunning landscape. It's an ancient reef system, and what used to be under the ocean is now far inland. And it's just remarkable to think of how ancient that landscape actually is. Tonight, they want to set up their cameras, but they need to make sure they don't get too close to the crocodiles that live in the river. These freshwater crocodiles are easily identified by their narrow snouts. Although less dangerous than saltwater crocodiles, their teeth can still cause serious injury. When there is a lot of commotion at the water's edge, they usually move off. The location now seems perfect for some time-lapse photography. Capturing the transition from day to night is considered the holy grail for astrophotographers. The lens aperture has to be readjusted by hand over a space of hours. Scott manages to get a particularly good shot this evening. Sometimes I'll find that it's midnight and something just happens. The energy levels just pick up. The attention really, really is sharp. I'm just simply awake, enjoying the night sky, just paying attention as to what's happening out there. Insects are out tonight. So there's a few insects out. Yeah. The uh, horizon's not straight, so I've got to fix that. Yeah. With the time lapse, really good to check everything is clicking through at the rates that it should be, uh, because there's a few things that can happen to <laughs> not go right uh, on occasion. So uh, the checking is really important. It's looking good. Their motif tonight, the emu in the sky. The emu is an Aboriginal constellation depicting a large Australian terrestrial bird. It is hidden in the Milky Way and is only visible when the surroundings are totally dark, as they are here. Just before 6 a.m., the sun comes up. The Kimberley region is one of the hottest spots in Australia, and the temperature soon rises. Having a lie-in in a tent is not a good idea. After two weeks of astrophotography, it's a tiring experience. There's a lack of sleep. Come on. 
the work has to happen at night time. That's, that's the occasion. But with the results that are achieved, it's really worth it. It's great, thank you. Uh, yeah. How's it going here? Mm, good. Yeah, so we're, we're underway with the, uh, the transfer yes. um, onto one of the hard drives. Okay. Good, okay. Yeah. So downloading a time-lapse sequence of photos, you never really know what you've got until the final check and the final production. Is the focus right? Is the composition exactly right? And what have you actually captured? Yeah, yeah. so more, more setup time, yes, yeah. earlier start time. Processing the image is a complex process and can take months, so we'll be done when they get home. The key now is to get as many good shots in the can as possible. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> On the Fairfield Leopold Downs Road, they now continue eastwards. The race to see the meteor shower is now on, but their destination is still over 500 kilometers away. The roads are tarmacked as far as Halls Creek, the last town before the crater. After that, it's just dirt tracks into the wilderness. Like many of the little townships in the Western Australian outback, Halls Creek was originally founded as a mine. Today, for many people passing through, the town is a place to refuel and stop for a bite to eat. John is a great admirer of the art of the Australian Aborigines and has a considerable collection at home. Before he and Scott make their way to the crater, they visit the Yaliil Art Centre, a gallery that exhibits the works of local Aborigine artists. One piece in particular catches John's eye. Isn't that the emu? They meet the artist Deirdre, who has a studio here. And as a child, we would always go camping. Like We'd yeah. never had one school holiday in town. We'd always go out bush. Awesome, yeah. And we'd just spend the whole two weeks out there. That's great. Just in the flat, wherever, yeah. next to the river. And as a child, and did you look up at the stars and always? Every night. Well, yes. this, this is just an absolutely fantastic painting. Um, you've even painted the, the eye of the emu. And I painted it because um, one time I seen a really big shooting star one night when we were outside. And um, a week later, I lost my mother. So I thought it just reminded me of my mother and painted for her. Yeah. So it's, it's a really special painting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for, for your mother. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The story is a sad one, but John loves the painting. Over the past few years, he has been captivated by the emu and what it stands for. This is... Uh, uh, just a, a wonderful representation of the, the emu in the sky, yeah. I love how you've got the texture and you can see all the dust cloud, um, so all these brown sections here. And it's really amazing how you've created that texture throughout the painting. It takes mm. a while for someone to see what I see, yeah. try to. the last gas station before the wilderness. If things go well, they will be at Wolf Creek Crater by evening. Unfortunately, the sky is overcast. Not a good sign. We went through Fitzroy Crossing and the service station there had no diesel. That's what you get for remote travel, is um, you don't know where your next fuel stop's going to be, so that's why we carry so much fuel. Um, this will take over 100 litres, and that will get me enough for the next destinations for a few days. Uh, 
uh, the weather forecast is quite almost funny. Um, it's first day, rain, storms, second day, rain, storms, third day, rain, possible showers, fourth day, rain. <laughs> Uh, so for an astrophotography journey, um, that's not the kind of forecast that you really want to hear. So um, the, the conditions are not great. We'll see what happens. They are now raring to go. On the Tanami Road, a dirt track, they are just 130 kilometers from the crater. While not a great distance on a normal road, the situation could get more difficult depending on the weather. The turnoff for Wolf Creek Crater is a few kilometers outside Halls Creek. This is where the dirt track begins, but it's blocked. Let's have a look. Right. Unbelievable. Okay. Yep. Road, this way. road closed. Road closed, closed and closed. This time of year. Unbelievable. Yep. Looking at that sign, that's all the way to the Northern Territory border. That. So that's, that's the whole of the Tanami Road closed. Yep. All this way and we can't get there. <laughs> and I suspect a fair bit of rain too. I'm expecting a decent yep. storm tonight. Mm. So let's um, get we'll, your map out. We'll bring and up the satellite images and see what, what the... our alternatives are. Yep, good. Yeah. They hadn't reckoned on this. During the monsoon, the roads are often impassable, which is why John and Scott uh, scheduled their trip for the dry season. This year, the weather doesn't seem to be playing by the rules. That's the groundwork like that. And so, so it looks like a lot of cloud to the, to the south. Uh, there's patchy cloud in this zone, and we've got a massive streaming cloud that covers all, all of Western Australia. So the options at this stage, um, Tanami Road, if it opens, and that's yeah, when, enough. when. Uh, the other possibility, if if we think beyond road, is um, is actually air travel. John wants to charter a helicopter. It's pricey, but their only chance of reaching the crater on time, since the meteor shower only lasts a few hours on one single night, and the weather is not improving. Estimated flight time to the crater, a good 30 minutes. Yeah, this is really challenging conditions, actually. Um, the weather, this is, a, this is a big weather system. Um, what we're hoping, and, and basically this is, this is a, a chance, um, the way the weather is coming through, we may get a clear patch. Uh, what we're aiming for is between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. tomorrow night. That's the window that we want. Fingers crossed, eh? I think so. Yes. <laughs> Up we go. All good? Yeah.
They arrange for the helicopter to collect them the next morning. Until then, they're on their own, with no mobile connection. Wolf Creek Crater has a cosmic event to thank for its existence. About 300,000 years ago, a meteorite made of iron and nickel weighing 50,000 tons smashed into the Earth's surface, creating a crater 800 meters wide. In heavy rainfall, water collects in the center, leaving mineral salts behind. Very few plants can survive these conditions. The sun has come out a little, but only temporarily. Yeah. Yeah. So this is quite a nice view through this section. It is a nice section through through here. This is nearly really original. By the time John and Scott reach the rim of the crater, the sun has gone in again and they only have this one night to catch the meteor shower. Hey, what do you think of the weather? <laughs> weather is interesting. So yeah, the, uh, the weather does seem against us. Um, there's clouds all around us, and uh, we've had some breaks in the clouds, but um, it's just clear, uh, it's yeah. just covered over again. That's right. And the sun's been trying to come out, but mm. no luck yet. Yeah. Ideally, we'd be set up by 1 a.m. Yeah. Um, and then really by about 2 a.m. onwards, and the final two hours uh, would be would be good. Okay. So, so fingers crossed. Things can change yeah. in right. that sort of time, but <laughs> there is a lot of cloud around at the moment. Yes, there so. is. I don't know. It's going to be challenging. Yeah. Right in time for sunset, the two men set up their cameras. Oh. Hey, John. Look. First star of the night. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. That that one's actually Jupiter. That one. Oh, so it's yeah. not a star. Yeah, not a star. It's a planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's uh, a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> so we shall wait. Every so often, the veil of cloud lifts. Mosquitoes are out. I'm still hopeful, I don't give up. Even if we get one hour's gap in the cloud, that will be enough to get, to get some reasonable images. But two hours later, a storm is brewing. Clouds cover the starry sky, allowing for no sign of the meteor shower. By the early hours of the morning, they realize that the mission has failed. It's a bitter disappointment. Astrophotography is a field where success and failure often sit side by side. I've, I've been in situations like this before, uh, and um, you know, sometimes it sometimes it comes through, sometimes it works. Uh, other times it doesn't. Unbelievable. Like, we've had this trip planned for over 12 months, and for this to happen, it kind of is sad, um, but yeah, you can't fight the weather. But uh, you have to do this, you have to make the effort. Um, not all the time do, do things work out you know, uh, as, as you hope for or, or perhaps expect, um, but uh, often it does. Only once they get home will they see that the trip through the Kimberley region was definitely worth it. They may not have any pictures of the meteor shower, but they have brought back an array of other spectacular shots.
and they still have a great goal for future expeditions. In the meantime, as with so many aims, it's often the journey rather than the arriving that counts. <laughs>